Hi and welcome to Open Air Podcast. Uh, for this special online episode, I've received Dmitry Petrov. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Iterative AI. Uh, they are the company behind uh, Data Fusion Control, which is DBC, also known as DBC. Uh, DBC is a tool for versioning data similar to Git. I uh, really think that you need to use this kind of tool in your machine learning process. Uh, you should also you, you should take a look at their channel, DBC Org, which is hosted by Eden O'Brien. Uh, to better understand how to use the tool and maybe try to use it for your machine learning process. Uh, but with Dimitri, uh, we have discussed his journey up to machine learning and how he got to work on DVC, uh, how he got this idea of uh, using it such a way of managing large data files, and how he managed to switch from a dev and technical position to a, more, uh, to a manager position, since he is now the CEO of his company. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it is not the usual standard of the podcast with more in person, but uh, with the COVID, it was difficult. And uh, since the uh, situation keep going on, I try to this, I, I've tried to, to do an online setup, but uh, let's take a look at that. And I hope you enjoy the podcast and uh, good listening. Um, yeah, you know, it's right because you need to have uh, some sort of balance because only working, exactly. or only doing nothing, yeah. you need to yes. have both. Sometimes you need to work harder and after you need to you know, take a rest, like something. Take exactly, time. exactly. Yeah. What do, what do you do usually when you want to uh, need to have a, a more relaxing time? I mean, relaxing time. I'm not sure I have this that one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for vacation or something like that? Vacation, yes. So I had a vacation this summer. I had like one week only. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. So not all that fortunately vacations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you, you work a lot. Okay, do you want to explain a little bit what you do first now and after we're going to go back, which is your study that you did? Yeah, sure. Uh, what we're doing right now, we are building tools for machine learning, right? Uh, DVC, data version control, is one of the tool. Uh, in, initially, I started the tool like about three years ago. I have built the first version, open sources, first version. And okay. now we have like. Did you start it by yourself or did it was it? Yeah, yeah, it was my project for like a first few months. Then more and more people uh, mm -hmm. were joining the project. Uh, and now uh, I kind of play a role of, uh, I would say, product uh, driving. I drive product requirements for DVC, basically. Okay. And now we created a company, right? Uh, like in Silicon Valley, like any. Anything becomes a company. Becomes a startup. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think it's a good definition for that. Yeah, you have an idea, so, make a business, do a startup, and try to sell it to someone. Uh, yeah, no matter what you do, like uh, sooner or later you will be a startup in Silicon Valley. So uh, now we are startup uh, venture backed, and we do tools for machine learning. DVC is one of our tool, uh, open source. Uh, we have built also CML. CI CD for machine learning. It's also open source. And we are building SaaS uh, kind of on top of those two. Okay. Uh, so the business model is really like all the code is open source, but you do a SaaS on it to for enterprise to uh, to get revenue. That's right? I not ex I mean yes, okay. kind of, but not exactly. So okay. the good question is when you do open source is how you do separation. Yeah, because it's a good question because I, I see a lot of people saying you cannot make money with open source cords, but you seem to do it. So uh, let, let's explain it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in, uh, uh, in a usual case, when you do, for example, databases, uh, you need to uh, usual approach is open core, right? When you have part of the code is open sourced, uh, but part is not. Uh, and you provide this like not open source part of a, it as a kind of like addition. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is like usual open core model and a lot of like databases and uh, other tools uh, using this model. Uh, another approach is kind of open source plus SaaS uh, when you can have a, like a, a more kind of more clear separation between uh, the open part and the SaaS part. Uh, when SaaS is not kind of 
part of open source. It's kind of argument open source. For example, like okay. Git and GitHub is this example. Uh, yeah, okay, I see, okay, yeah, yeah okay. Right? Uh, so they're kind of related. One uses another one, right? But they're different products, absolutely different products. Yeah, yeah, it's true, yeah. And if you thought of that, that's, it, it, it's, Git is really an open source code, uh, open source tool. And if you want to use it, you can do it by yourself. Just mount a Git server. But GitHub is a SaaS over Git, using Git. Oh, it's true. Exactly, it. yeah. And we have kind of a, the same uh, the same ideas in mind. So we are thinking about DVC as an open project. Uh, open product, no, at least today, we don't have any plans to like monetize this. I don't believe you can monetize like version control. And uh, uh, CML is the same. It's also open sourced. Uh, it's all open sourced here. Yeah. And uh, we build SaaS, SaaS on top, kind of like, uh, GitHub, it's a terrible analogy actually, uh, but uh, kind of GitHub <laughs> on top kind of. Kind of, okay, okay. Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, how, how did you did you manage to get the skills to do like a big project? Because this, I think you are more technical and now you're doing more business. So how did you manage to, to learn all the skills and do and manage in that? Uh, yeah, I have... Uh few kind of tricks. First trick is uh, I'm old. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so <laughs> uh, in a couple of years, I will be 40. So <laughs> I have enough time to learn a lot of stuff. Yeah, I learn life stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, I think Business skills are very important, of course, but they're not as heavy as technical skills, I think. Mm -hmm. And if you have a kind of a good technical skills, I think you can um, learn uh, business more or less. And um, yeah, this is my belief. I don't know like how. Uh, but you, you how are willing to is, but... learn. You are hmm? willing to learn uh, business stuff. Yeah, this is a good question. And uh, to be honest, I don't know like when I start interested in business. Uh, mm -hmm. I do remember some stories from my childhood when someone explained me how, for example, venture capital works. Uh, it was, I believe it was, I was like maybe 14, maybe 15. Uh, I, I lived in Russia, which means like so Soviet Union just collapsed and some, my friend explained me idea of venture capital. And I like, I'm not sure I, I get it. He, he was saying something like uh, some people invest in companies uh, and 10 companies, uh, in 10 companies, but nine fail, but one is super successful and he gets enough return back. And I was thinking about this and, and, and answered something like an old joke, like, right. So I think I get it, but I didn't get like why he invested in the nine which failed. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I heard the story about venture capital, uh, like back then, like long, long time ago. I was very interested in computers, uh, of course, games, of course, right? At that time, actually, it was time when uh, venture capital in, in, in invested in, uh, in computer games. Okay. So maybe this is one of the reasons why I started interested in, in this field. And later, and later, um, uh, I was kind of um, become interested in business in general. So I was like a computer science student uh, because uh, in my kind of priorities, computers like are way higher than business, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. And, uh, but I still was interested in business. I, I read a lot of like books about business. Okay. Uh, mostly some kind of uh, popular ones, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the biggest one. The, about the... business, yeah. Okay. And then uh, I start reading uh, Paul Graham, uh, you know, like about the startup, startups. It was maybe like 15 years ago. And uh, at that time I realized how venture capital works. Finally, I mean, I didn't get it. After fight. a couple of years. <laughs> Not a couple of years, it's like 10 plus years. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you, those kind of concepts when you're young don't have really meaning because you don't, like you said, being old give you some sort of 
understanding of life and concept of life. So it's normal, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it was like very interesting to uh, see how people kind of tra uh, translate ideas to some business. And when I was thinking like what to do in my life, I was thinking like I need to like invent something like cool, big and uh, useful, right? And, but I didn't know like what exactly how it should look like. Should I go to some like a big company and work for a big company or maybe some research institution or something? Uh, I have tried, I mean, I had some experience, but I realized, uh, I mean, I, I joined to some companies, uh, to one company, to another company, uh, it went pretty well. So I got some skills, it was great, uh, but it was probably not what I need. I, I was more interested in kind of implementing some new idea, like completely new ideas. Not so just you were improving. really young, young, starting to feel the need that you wanted to do your own stuff and new ideas instead of working for someone else with his ID. Uh, I would say not necessarily my ideas, but some okay. kind of a big ideas. Okay, uh, a bigger picture. Some, uh, not even bigger picture, but something like from the future. Something that. Oh, okay, future. okay. Something. Uh, yeah, and I tried like uh, different things uh, at uh, when I was student. I was working on kind of image processing stuff, uh, and I was thinking like, how can I make, make business out of this? Can I recognize some, I don't know, car plates or something can make some service uh, and sell some kind of part of the service or like technology behind. Uh, but it was absolutely not clear how to, how to do this, how to do the business part. And, it, and at that time it was probably not the best time to do image uh, business on image yeah, process. Image on, on yeah, yeah, it yeah. was like before uh, actually, convolution network were invented, but I didn't know about convolution network at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and then later, uh, one of my classmates come up with some idea. Why don't we create like file sharing service? And and then we had a discussion. We discussed like almost a month, and then we decided to do this. And we have built the service, and we launched the service. We even start selling. I mean, saying it's kind of probably not the best word, uh, but we got some users who paid. And I remember when the first guy paid, we spent maybe like one hour to find everything about him. <laughs> 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 By email, we found that this was a guy from Australia. Uh, he does some music related stuff, uh, like DJ or something, or organizer some of events, music events, so something like this. Uh, he paid us, I don't remember exactly, like seven or ten dollars. And we spent probably 40 uh, for beers this night. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you should know about my business, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but just the experience is interesting too, you know, and it's the first one, so you have to sometimes lose it a bit for to gain more. Yeah, yeah. So that was fun. The, uh, the problem with this business, we built this, uh, we, we got some customers. We didn't know how to do marketing properly. Uh, we didn't mm -hmm. know how to uh, exit from this business. So uh, based on my current experience, I, I would say we should, if I would do this next time, if uh, I would do, uh, I would spend some more time on marketing because the service was decent. We can get like more users. We got like thousands, a few thousands and maybe like dozens of paid, but we can make like 10 times, 10 X out of this. And it might be some exit. So it, it, it was a good enough business to sell to some like bigger companies. Okay. Uh, if I would be in Silicon Valley, I would just go and raise next round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just yes, but going, like okay. I, I was not, uh, but it was still possible to kind of make some exit, but we didn't make it. We just didn't know like what to do with this. <laughs> and after a while, we just shut down the bit, the web server. That's it. Oh, so okay. it was money. And after this was in Russia, right? Yeah, you yeah. We're still yeah. in Russia. Okay. And uh, why did you choose to move in uh, California? Uh, well, um, I have a friend, and he uh, he's saying that uh, if you do very well on, uh, in high tech. 
statistically, you will end up in California. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is more or less what happens with me. <laughs> okay. So we, we're doing right, so let's go to California. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of has some, I don't know, some uh, like chemistry or maybe some uh, something which attracts a lot of uh, people from this industry especially who is interested in business and stuff. So this is how I, I think uh, it happens. Uh, but the story actually longer, but much longer than uh, it sounds. Uh, first of all, I decided to move to US because I was thinking, all right, uh, I uh, work as software engineer for a while. I did some research in like uh, at the university. Then I become like full time uh, at university and I, I even had a lab like uh, kind of research group, small, very small research group, but I had like contracts, you know, like regular university stuff, which was, it was cool. And then I was thinking like what to do next. And uh, university seems like a good idea, uh, but I decided not to kind of continue this path and returning back to industry also kind of didn't seem like a, uh, didn't look like a good idea. And uh, then I was thinking, yes, yes, I need to do like startup. I kind of had, had this dream, right, from childhood uh, first. And then we had some experience, which was actually, it was great. It was not kind of success story, but it was great experience. And I just need to do like something like this and finally become like invent something big and new. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it like not clear how to do this, right? Because like in Russia, you cannot trade just around, right? You need to build like, a profitable businesses a profitable business from get go uh, okay. or you need to move to silicon valley or somewhere else so uh, it was also not easy but at that time i just got some opportunity to join microsoft okay i was kind of like thinking looking around and uh, found that uh, they have some event in russia when they kind of hire developers and some of my friends recommended me I went to event, I got the job offer and I was sure I'm joining. <laughs> so this, this is how I uh, moved to um, uh, Seattle to kind of to head headquarter, right? Microsoft. Okay. So it was a kind of surprise to me because uh, first of all, yes, I, uh, I had a plan to move uh, to US, especially in Silicon Valley was kind of my priority, I would say. Uh, but uh, idea of working for Microsoft sounds really good at that time and i was also surprised because i got job from the first time because i heard some stories that, that people apply like one time second time and maybe third time they got offer and had and they're happy to relocate right so it was kind of surprise and uh, yeah and, uh, and what did you I, do uh, for microsoft pardon what did you do for microsoft so i joined bing uh being right so search engine uh, first yeah. year i was uh, a software engineer in platform team uh, this is the team which kind of invert index kind of one team reads the entire internet right <laughs> yeah 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 yes. <laughs> index all your internet yes <laughs> Uh, no, 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 it's, it's a more complicated. Uh, so yeah, yeah, but it's one you just call reads, every page, web page that exists. Almost. Yeah, one team reads the internet, our team inverts the internet, and the third team uh, serves uh, the internet as an index. So this okay. is how, um, uh, what, what I did. Uh, it was cool, but uh, I mean this kind of like, I was tra uh, transitioning from this George, right? I worked for, uh, for a few years in research and then I moved to engineering. Engineering was really cool because I, uh, I like engineering. I got some experience before, uh, but I need some kind of research experience, some, you know, something when you can try, uh, fail, try again, uh, and probably fail again, but like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fell a couple of times before. Yeah, yeah, when you're looking for something, when you're searching, when you have kind of this uh, need to find something. And then I found uh, another team, uh, which did, uh, the team was focused on more uh, like what we call machine learning today. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have titles like data scientist or something, but I, in fact, I, I was doing this work, uh, work of data science. And a couple years later, they uh, introduced this title and I formally become data scientist in this team. 
so this was a really good experience because first of all, it was kind of between research and software engineering. Uh, it was Microsoft, which means there are a lot of smart people around and you can learn. Uh, yeah, a lot and of big stuff. opportunity too. Yeah, and uh, what, el what, what was very new for me, I realized that how different software engineering is compared to data science. So uh -huh. it was kind of like uh, absolutely an experience for me because I was, I, I thought that when you do research, you do research, right? And kind of, you don't have like processes and stuff and it's fine. Uh, when you do software engineering, you have to be like rigorous about the process and you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And what I learned at Microsoft, no. When you do research, when you do your experiments, you also need, need uh, have to be rigorous about the stuff. You also need kind of support the tools uh, and uh, you need to collaborate with the team properly, right? Not just like, hey, this is my email with my model, like do whatever you do with, with the models, right? Yeah. <laughs> it should be organized in a different way. Uh, and the Microsoft have, have a, uh, has a decent tool inside uh, for model, for data engineering, for serving, uh, for analyzing, for visualizing, like everything, the entire stack of tools. Today, like people call this like AI platforms, right? Yeah, and yeah. they have a uh, Microsoft has a huge, huge AI platform inside. So, and I was thinking, all right, this is cool because it's, it seems like something new is happening in this field, and I should be somewhere in the middle of this kind of <laughs> shift. And I was thinking, like, what, uh, how the world should look like in the future? Okay, we do have this platform inside Microsoft. It's great. It helps us a lot. I mean, I couldn't say it's, it gives you like a nice experience, but it's absolutely clear. Uh, it provides value for the camp, for the team. Mm -hmm. This is what abs was absolutely clear. And I start thinking, but how about the rest of the world? They need the same tool. I mean, they need the same best practices, not necessarily yeah, the yeah, same yeah, tools. Yeah. And how those AI platforms should look like in five years and 10 years, right? And then I start thinking about this, like, uh, like how they should look like, and can I build one? Uh, can I do something about it? Like, uh, can I introduce some kind of innovation in this field? And on the side, I start, I start playing with this uh, tool set. Uh, tool set kind of in the open source stack, right? Not inside Microsoft, but outside. Okay. And I realized then nothing, literally nothing. You have to kind of reinvent everything from scratch. Uh, and this was a, kind of another big surprise. How huge was the difference between kind of being, being a data scientist inside company and being a data scientist of outside of the company. Um, because in, in a company you're well equipped, equipped, it might be not the best equipment, but you have a lot of different tools. But outside you have kind of nothing. So, and uh, yeah, I started playing with the tool set, um, like how to get resources from cloud, how to train properly, how to provide the best experience. And I like kind of developer development experience. Uh, development experience, development tools, like programming languages, right? I kind of uh, a big fan of this uh, smooth experience for developers, for, for people who create software. And I realized it's like really hard to solve this problem until you solve a uh, data management problem. Yeah, data management is a really big problem. It's still a really big problem, I think, for most of the companies. Yeah, yeah. When you need to train something in a cloud, you need to first bring data set in, in, in mm -hmm. the cloud, right? Then the next question would be, like, but uh, how? Would you like to copy your data? Probably not. <laughs> you know, it takes time, right? Uh, you should have like a copy uh, there, right? And then you end up having copy there and here and your local machine and like, you know. <laughs> you know and you don't happens. know the, very, the good version too because maybe you did locally some uh, modification exactly, exactly. and outside they don't have the modification too. Yeah. And then you, uh, uh, I learned, okay, you need uh, a way to transfer data and you need to add version data mm -hmm. uh, and kind of solve all this conflict with, with the data set. So this is like, was very clear. I need to invent this thing before I jump to kind of resource orchestration part, before I jump to training in a cloud. 
And the same thing with uh, other scenarios. When you train in the cloud, you get some result, you get some nice plot, you need to be, uh, get this plot back, right? You need yeah, to look yes. at the plot. And it, it, it's kind of the same kind of versioning problem. Uh, because you need to know that this plot was based on this code with this data. Because otherwise you will get lost like very soon after like five experiments, so you get lost. <laughs> and especially if you have more multiple and multiple models and you yes. just share them with colleague, it just it's just getting mm -hmm. a mess. Just with only with myself because before when I started my my master degree in, in machine learning, I did not know that those two, and I was just doing .txt files with all my results. And it was really painful and was only with myself. So at one point I lost uh, two or three experiments and I was so mad at myself that I said, no, I cannot work <laughs> like that. And then I found uh, ML flow. I found uh, a lot of tools, but right. I did not know right. I, I had a problem because I did not church for one. And I, for myself it was okay, but I just imagine myself working with two, three, four, 10,000 colleagues and sharing TXT file. You cannot work like that. Exactly, exactly. And I had some uh, bad experience as well, especially when you like come up with some like a really good result. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you like, but wait a minute, but how, how I got it? <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between this one and this one? I'm not sure which parameters I changed. It. And it, does it was the same data set too? So oh, it's really painful. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, one of my uh, teammate one time just uh, accidentally removed his models. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's happening, it's happening. So mm -hmm. you need to, you need, it's, especially when you're working with, I think with computer science, you need, we got tools, you just need to find them and we need to use it brilliantly, I think, because Like Git, it's really useful, but it's doing a part of the job. And now you need to have something for Git for the data set, Git something for uh, the models and everything. So uh, I, I think it, it's just so evident that we need to like that, that I don't know how I lived before using that. So Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, uh, when I was at academia, it was not a problem. Uh, it, 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 it was kind of, a, I would say, I would put it in another way. It was a problem. It was not a big pain point. It was not the mm -hmm. biggest pain point. Uh, yeah. But when I work at a large company at Microsoft, I have seen uh, how big com how big teams work, how team interact between each other, and this uh, this is when it becomes a big pain point. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. you cannot make like 20 people work on the same model if you don't have a proper uh, tool set. It's so, a good code. Yeah, so this is uh, how I uh, come up with this idea of DVC, uh, data version control, right? Uh, I was thought like what to do about this and I found let's build something like very quickly. Uh, and the uh, idea was I would take Git and I would extend uh, Git, that's it, right? Easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, and it took us uh, three years uh, to build <laughs> version one. Before, uh, I, before version one? Uh, I mean, I released version zero point something uh, in four months. In four months, I built the first version. It was zero point something. Uh, it did. It has some functionality, right? A very very basic one. Uh, but the problem itself uh, is way more complicated than it looks like, okay. because you can get like all these like edge cases, uh, all different edge mm -hmm. cases first and second. Uh, There are many, uh, first of all, edge cases. Second is uh, there are many different use cases, right? Some people like to transfer everything. Uh, uh, the other needs like one particular file. Uh, and it seems like not a big deal, but like when you uh, try to build a nice uh, kind of set of commands, it's not easy to come up with like a nice set of commands. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a user experience. and to get a bit good user experience, uh, it's a really painful problem uh, in developing <laughs> tool spaces especially. For example, in compilers, uh, maybe like 20, 30% of the code is about like how compiler handle errors, how to point in the right line 
not the line when like compiler realizes it's a problem because most likely it realizes a problem uh, when you forget to like close the, you know, some, I don't know, uh, forget to put some parentheses. It's like a 20 yeah. lines uh, after. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, can, it can just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, yeah, don't so, wanna, you don't want to get to the, like you said, you don't want to get to the line that the compiler said, oh, I think it's a problem. You want to get to the line that here you got a problem. Yeah, yeah. So, it, and, and, and same here, you need to provide this like a nice uh, experience and it took a lot of resources uh, to handle the errors properly. Uh, and to come up with a nice set of uh, commands that people can like, you know, uh, keep in, the, in, in their brains because like you, don't, you cannot handle uh, a lot of like abstractions, heavy abstractions, right? Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. And especially on the command. So yeah, and it took like a, a three years to build the version 1.0, which was released like in, in May, like three, four months ago. Oh yeah, for real. I, I thought it was it was uh, the version one one was before because I started using DVC I think uh, in November last year. So I was in. No, it was not one point zero. Oh it okay. It was uh, lo end of last year. It was uh, zero point nine something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I was be I was in the first user of it. <laughs> uh yeah you um, one? I, I was in the in the hundred first <laughs> yeah yeah at the time there were like thousands already so you're probably somewhere in the first thousand between the like, thousand and, <laughs> <laughs> and um and how do you uh how do you see dvc in future do you do you see a full integration do you see ui uh, how do you think user really might need to uh, use DVC? Is it a common line option or is it more with a UI? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And it's not only about DVC, I would say. It's about uh, AI platforms in general. Because uh -huh. DVC, like what, what is DVC? It's, it's supposed to be like a foundation layer for yeah. platform, uh, for platforms, for AI platforms that uh, people, people build, right? And even today, some people use DVC as a part of their, uh, as a building block of their infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. And what I believe, and it was, it was also one of the kind of idea that I started with, uh, I don't believe in AI platform, in monolithic AI platforms. I don't believe that people will be using AI platforms like, uh, like one inside Microsoft, for example. Uh, I believe in five and 10 years, uh, we won't have AI platforms. We will have kind of an ecosystem of tools. Uh, when data scientists, uh, engineers can just get some like building blocks, uh, chain them together in some like meaningful workflow, and they will be using this uh, workflow. Okay. So this is kind of a big belief behind, uh, behind DVC and, and the company actually. Uh, we don't build only DVC. We build DVC, we build CML, we build like SAS kind of. We build kind of part of those ecosystems, uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem. And we don't even expect to own the entire ecosystem. I believe ecosystem is huge. Uh, yeah, so, so other solution can come here and patch some something between two. So not, like, okay, it's interesting, interesting, because I think uh, interesting part of that is because we really see like data scientists and machine learner or something like that, that they are a sole worker doing a model and training, but I think they need an ecosystem for them, people to help, not like an engineer. Yeah. So I really see what that interesting is that they need people to help build a tool to do their job. So they need engineer, right. they need data engineer, they need whatever around them. And I think that's really uh, point, point out that you need to do code, but you need people with better understanding of code to help you build tool to do what you want to, what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is one kind of uh, assumption, uh, or maybe my belief. <laughs> uh, it's it's about like ecosystem of the tool instead of like a monolithic AI platform. Uh, and another assumption that uh, we have behind behind our tool set is uh, the AI platforms, uh, the AI ecosystem need to be part of the software engineering ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it has to reuse the same building blocks as software engineering one. For example, I don't believe you need to reinvent like version control for source code. There are already like so many like good tools. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
for resource uh, for resources uh, for automating validation uh, the CI CD systems right why don't you use the same thing uh, for AI the use case will be different the purpose mm -hmm. is different uh, the users are different but still you can utilize this machine machinery right behind the CI systems the same UI that uh, GitLab Git, GitHub provides or Travis AI Travis uh, CI right uh, and uh, this is kind of another uh, belief uh, behind our um, uh, tool set uh, and, you oh yeah, yeah so you could go ahead yeah so uh, DVC extends uh, Git right okay. then uh, our CMOS uh, extends CI CD systems like github actions and gitlab ci cd uh, we will be doing like more ci cd tools because they're different and they need to be kind of uh, unified a bit uh, and we are building sas which is kind of extends gitlab and github experience we don't want to replace them they're great right mm -hmm. uh, but we we'd like to provide some uh, experience with uh, uh, for quantitative projects, right? When you have navigation around uh, metrics, right? Uh, when you have a metrics driven approach uh, to evaluate your models, to evaluate your commits, experiments, and uh, this is uh, what we are doing right now. Okay, and, uh, and how do you see uh, and, integration of CI in for ML model? Because um, I think it's some, like if you want to integrate a website, it's kind of not easy, but it's straightforward because you just launch the website to a server, the server just responds. Right. But right. What, which model they have a particularity where you want to build them and you want to train them, you want to evaluate them. So they have a really long process with GPU and stuff like that. How, how do you, how does managing that is, it is complex or it's just me because I don't have enough understanding of that maybe? Uh, yeah, CI CD in machine learning is different. Uh, it's not the same as in software engineering, uh, but it solves the same uh, fundamental problem. Okay. So, why do we need CI uh, in software engineering? Uh, one of the biggest reasons is to close the gap between your development environment and production environment. Mm -hmm. right? If your code went through CI CD, then your like, DevOps team knows exactly how to get this result. Uh, and it gives them like a solid foundation for like collaboration with, with you, like to ask question, right? Why it fails mm -hmm. or uh, what happens or why it doesn't work, right? They just go to CICD and, 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 and find, find out why it doesn't. Uh, the same for ML. What you need is to check if model works. However, this process is very different, right? Because in software engineering, okay, what does it mean it works? It just runs, right? It doesn't fail in some cases. In mm -hmm. machine learning, it's, it's absolutely different. It's it, this process kind of metrics driven. You cannot say, uh, you cannot give uh, give some signals, right? Get result and say, okay, it works because last time it gave me the same result. No, but how about other cases? How about corner cases? So mm -hmm. you need to look at the, at, at the entire distribution of like your answers, right? Uh, so you need to kind of distribution of your scores. Uh, and what does it mean? It means uh, you should provide some kind of quantit quantitative test of your models, right? Uh, for example, run some uh, uh, batch of, uh, not experiments, uh, but like testing results, take uh -huh. a look at the distribution and make sure the distribution looks the same in terms of like standard deviations, uh, like, standard deviations or uh, some other metrics, right? Mean, average, whatever you prefer, whatever makes sense for your particular model, for your particular result. Uh, it's, it might be a good idea to check corner cases, right? Uh, especially you work, if you work in some critical areas like self-driving cars, they do like <laughs> tons of like corner cases, right? Uh, 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 and this is what you're supposed to do in, in, in CI system. So in general, the process is the same. You got the result, you put somewhere to the third party and the third party runs the test and gives you like the answer. In the first scenario, answer is yes, no. In the second scenario, in machine learning, you just get a bunch of metrics and then you decide 
if it's good for you or if it's not. Okay. So the process, the process is a little bit less autonomous because you need, you still need to validate. You can do a part autonomous, but someone need to say, yes, this model is still good. Okay. Uh, in many cases, yes, uh, okay. but uh, in some cases you can automate it. Okay. It is possible to automate, it's possible to say uh, something like, you know what, if my uh, like average within like one sigma, I don't care, it works. Let's go and let's deploy to production. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> okay. uh, in, in some cases it's, it's okay to do this, in other it's not. Okay, and uh... Same question, but for, 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 for now, how do you see the evolution of that in the future? Uh, you evolution of uh, CI, CD and integration with other stuff. Do you think there's going to have new stuff, interesting stuff or model to evaluate? I don't know, something like that. Uh, so First of all, yeah, I believe we will have uh, this uh, ecosystem of the tool, which means uh, the tool uh, uh, should be compatible with each other. Mm -hmm. When you can like replace one tool by another tool and still have kind of a meaningful uh, process. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I believe this should, should happen, kind of like unification uh, around the workflow. Uh, also, we need to, unify ML process itself, right? Because today it's like not formalized, not, not well formalized, I would say. Uh, and it's also required some formalization kind of methodology, methodology behind, right? That we have in software engineering. So this should happen. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I think this is kind of the big uh, shift that uh, needs to happen in the next I don't know, five years, I would say. And, uh, you know, in software engineering, like how, uh, how long it will take uh, to establish all the best practices that we come up uh, with today. It's about like 30 yeah, years. Yeah. It's about 30 yeah, years. Yeah, 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 it's true, it's true, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, as I saw, I think it was like maybe a couple months ago, they started big, the big uh, ML platform, like uh, PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow, to add the the same uh, method on some of the, like if you want to do the, the mean, it's going to be the same function for everyone. So they start, they're starting to uh, standardize the, uh, the, uh, the API. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is pretty clear, this is happening. Uh, this is happening. And, but uh, I really, really hope that it won't take 40 years <laughs> for, for machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to. <laughs> it's gonna be long, <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I really hope we can make it like in five, ten years, but not thirty. <laughs> and we have like a good reasons for this. We have a good reasons for this. First reason yeah. is uh, internet, uh, right? Because software engineering st started when internet was not kind of a common thing. Yeah, uh, sure. Second, uh, and second, we can reuse some of some ideas from software engineering, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, I have this idea, right? Like uh, uh, data science is different from software engineering as uh, software engineering from uh, hardware design. Yeah. Uh, so, but still we can, uh, I, there is a different, uh, definitely like a huge gap, but we can make it uh, way faster this time. Yeah, I think, I think people have interest to breaking this, this gap too, because uh, they are more and more interested in AI and machine learning and everything. So people allocate a lot of resource, but uh, you know, sometimes you have a hype and after you just come down a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's true. I, I think the, the field have a big uh, interest in doing that because if we are standardized or more clear with us, between us, it's, it's going to be just easier and easier for everyone to, to, to train model, uh, product, make it production model and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another reason why it can happen faster, I see more and more uh, folks go, as you said, right? More and more folks go to this field, to AI field. And at university, I see that uh, st 
strongest people try to go to AI direction, to machine learning, not to software engineering. It's, it's good and bad, but uh, this is what, what is happening. Uh, do you uh, think uh, to make a good AI or ML engineer, you need to do a software engineering bachelor degree or uh, another one? What do you think is the preferred or the best, to your understanding and to your opinion, uh, to do the best uh, AI uh, developer? Uh, I, it's, it's hard to say, actually. Uh, I know for sure that software engineering skills helps a lot. Software mm -hmm. engineering skills is the hardest skill uh, for any like AI person, I would say. Uh, however, important thing is kind of a mindset. Uh, because when people do, when people work in software engineer for like a while, uh, they already have a kind of a mindset uh, of engineers. They need to like everything to be like predefined, well defined, mm -hmm. I would say, right? Kind of algorithmical, right? Uh, AI people have a little bit different mindset. They kind of think um, using kind of a different ideas, I don't know, analogies or um, thought process a little bit different, right? And I think this is, uh, this is very important. Uh, and another trend, what is happening, uh, we spend more and more time on internet, right? And all this idea of quantification numbers and stuff, they kind of naturally came, uh, we are getting them naturally, right? You know, like what, how to make your picture to get like uh, 30 likes instead of like five likes from mm -hmm. your relative, right? So you kind of have the feeling uh, how big numbers works. And you know that if you're uh, submitting some like, successful pic pic uh, picture, right? You won't get like two times more likes. You will get like 10 times more likes, most likely, right? Kind of, yeah. you have a feeling of like, is this like exponential uh, distributions and uh, stuff like this. And it becomes like part of our kind of, uh, I don't know, culture, I, I don't know like what what's the, the best way to describe. Uh, but like uh, younger people, kids understand this very well, the quantitative part. And for them, it's more natural to do like AI, I would say, than software engineering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Because it's more about getting the number or, and understanding the like you have number to reach or something like that, than just be logical maybe, or really methodic, because I think software engineering is really methodic in some kind. Of, and I think you need also a more uh, like a kind of creativity, creativity, creativity parts also to be an engineer, a software engineer, because making code is some kind of creative, oh my God, creative work. Uh, yeah, 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 it's no, interesting. No, uh, both of this uh, job have creativities, a lot of creativity. Yeah, creativity. but I think it's different. It, it's just different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah. I, can, I, can, I can give you some, like some examples, like when you, uh, when you have some problem, for example, your data, you try to train, train a model and your data doesn't fit into your memory, like what software engineer, engineer does. He's thinking, all right, I need to get a bigger machine uh, or I need to use some algorithm to like compress my data somehow to fit it in. Uh, but like what, how a uh, quantitative person think? Well, I can sample. Uh, I can uh, apply some another algorithm which doesn't consume as much memory. I don't care, it might be worse. I mean, I will figure this out later, right? So they kind of have a little bit different uh, mentality to solve uh, this, this problem. Yeah, that's true, that's true. I never thought about that. And uh, for yourself, how do you see now, because we spoke that you are more like a startup now, you're more like a business. Uh, how do you see now your role in all of that? Do you feel more like a, still an, an engineer, more like AI field? How do you define yourself in that? Oh, this is a not easy, not an easy question. For now, uh, so as a company, we have, uh, we already have like 15 plus people. And unfortunately, I kind of spend most of my time for, for like management related stuff, unfortunately. So I do this product development stuff. I mean, product development, not the coding part, right? But defining requirements, uh, mm -hmm. talk with people, talk with users uh, to kind of summarize uh, the result, try to prioritize like what is important this month, what is important this year. 
uh, stuff like this. But uh, I I'm not doing enough engineering, not enough, but not doing much engineering work right now. <laughs> okay. And the same with modeling. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time for modeling as well. And even when I provide feedback for uh, some new features, for example, sometimes I even use like very simple examples from like my previous experience. What I sometimes I have a feeling, all right, I need some like a cool project to work on to test all the stuff like in real life. But in reality, like I need like a, two weeks to do this. Like how can I get like two weeks of my uh, from my schedule? So uh, yeah, this is like a big problem for me. So I am kind of becoming right now uh, more and more managers, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer, do you miss the engineer part or? Yes, for sure, for sure. And uh, the problem is you need to kind of prioritize. And I had like a lot of, a lot of time I had this kind of discussion with myself, <laughs> if you wish, <laughs> like what, what should I do? Uh, what is the best? And uh, what I decided, uh, I decided to prioritize uh, our products. So I'm thinking, look, I'm thinking like, what is the best for the product? Is it the best if I will start coding? Is it the best if I start more kind of test the product on some uh, mm -hmm. more uh, uh, heavier, heavier ML project? So, and I, then, then I decide like what, what, what to do. Uh, based on this and for today at least for the next for the last like a few months uh, i do mostly like management stuff uh, but from time to time i switch to from one role to another role kind of i don't code anymore unfortunately i mean i don't code like a, i don't take like significant tasks okay day, uh because i don't have like times so i don't have like a five days of uh, coding time for that yeah. for, for coding done yeah unfortunately uh, but yeah, but I still try to find kind of some time to do more deep product related stuff sometimes uh, to find better, uh, better ML problem to test our uh, software on or just to focus purely on management stuff just because I have to. Okay. And uh, we didn't talk about uh, a lot about your formation, but I know that you did a doctorate. Uh, do you feel that this full formation starting from the bachelor up to the doctorate uh, give you a good uh, preparation for what you do now uh, because you still manage a project and stuff like that do you think the formation was good for what you do now uh well it's uh one second uh, i have my skype okay so solved Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I would say uh, when you do business, uh, especially when you do like high-tech business, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's never enough. It's never enough. You, all the time you are learning and you are, th you are thinking, oh my God, why I didn't learn this? Why I didn't know this? Why I, di I haven't read this book? Uh, it's, is it on my side, right? Uh, I have some noise, I see, I hear some noise. <laughs> Interesting. I'm sorry. So, okay. I hope it's better now. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so, but for me, it works, I think, pretty good because I, I, I get some skills in quantity theory because I was part of, I was in applied math department. Uh, and my first kind of my bachelor was about image processing, a very quantitative area, as you can imagine. Uh, then I s it, it was before neuro networked uh, on images. Uh, I mean, they worked somehow, but it, the result was not uh, perfect at this time. At that time, yeah, it was not and, popular. Uh, yeah, and what we did, we did like different types of transformation, like a scene transformation, uh, wavelet transformation. My bachelor was about wavelet wavelets for some. Uh, image uh, problems and uh, oh, later I was contributing to open source library image hash it's basically like how to quantify your image to like compare if the images are same or different okay. and usually you you do like some kind of transformation first right and then you compare result of transformation between images okay. and I implemented like wavelet based uh, hashing uh, for this particular library it was pretty cool and uh, 
So if you use like terminology from deep learning, it's kind of like autoencoder. Uh, autoencoder, so you kind of build autoencoder and then you run image through the autoencoder and compare results of okay. uh, encoding. So this is how I would explain this uh, hashing, image hashing stuff today. The cool stuff is it was unsupervised because it's like not uh, ML, right? It's just like a regular algorithm. Uh, so yeah, it was my kind of initial uh, first steps uh, at, at the university. But then I switched to more quantitative, not quantitative, but more algorithmical area. And my master was, and, and the master and PhD was about algorithms, kind of very okay. classical software, uh, computer science. And the reason was, when I did images, I kind of had a strange feeling about my results. I didn't believe to my results because we didn't have like a good data set, good size data sets. Uh, and when you work with a quantity fields, you need like millions of images, right? Like today, mm -hmm. this image net, like millions of images. And then you have a chance to build kind of a decent uh, algorithm, which you can apply to other areas. In my case, we had like hundreds of images. And this is why I didn't uh, kind of That's believe. not a big stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking like, uh, would I like to spend like another two or probably like five, seven years on this? And I decided, no, if I don't believe to my result, probably I shouldn't do this. Yeah, this is why I transferred to more algorithmic area. I, I changed like supervisor and uh, uh, did algorithmic part. So, but yeah, but some of my friends did uh, continue to work on this. For example, I have one friend, uh, friend, he's in Canada and he did research about uh, convolutional network. His entire PhD is based on 57 images. <laughs> it was like 15 years ago. It was kind of a reasonable <laughs> data set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was a funny time. Uh, yeah. So, and, uh, I kind of had this mix, right, of uh, data, quantitative field, and uh, computer science, classical computer science, and software engineering. And this helps me a lot, helps me a lot on build the tool that we do. I actually work on in the, in the intersection, right? Intersection of uh, the machine learning, if you wish, and uh, software engineering, kind of. I, we automate, we automate uh, ML. Okay. Um, it's starting to, we're almost at one hour. So I'm going to ask two last questions. Do you read book? Do we have a, I'm going to start a little bit. Um, I usually ask for, uh, the last question, if you have a, a book to recommend to us or a podcast, I know, I don't know if you are a big reader or a podcast listener. So if you want to recommend to us something that we should read or listen to, feel free to share. Well, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, okay, uh, the last book I have read is a Phoenix Project. A Phoenix Project. Okay. It's a funny book. Uh, it's not supposed to be scientific or, or anything, but it's actually about DevOps. <laughs> mm. Okay. It's actually about DevOps and they basically build the entire book. It's kind of a story. It's not like a technical, it's, it's not supposed to be technical, but okay. it's a story around kind of DevOps and best practice around DevOps. But the cool thing about book, and I knew about this before, and I read this because, because I'd like to kind of feel better the DevOps space. Uh, and the cool thing about this book, it's not only about DevOps, it's about management in general. Okay. How to feel, uh, find a bottleneck in a business, how to kind of organize processes around this bottleneck, like, a lot of, lot of interesting ideas uh, here and it's just a book. It's not like a kind of, uh, mm, it's just a story. And it, it, it was a pleasure to read this uh, book. Okay, okay, uh, interesting, interesting. Because I don't know, uh, I don't, DevOps feels, for me, I was, for me by myself, it, it feels, I don't, I'm not sure what it is. So I just, I heard that word. I know that it's development operation. Okay. But what is really, uh, it's interesting. I, I, may take, I may take a look uh, at it. And uh, do you have a podcast also that you will, you will like to share or something like that? Anything else that you will, you will have? Uh, yeah. So I think the best podcast, I, I, I like podcasts, uh, software engineering daily. 
Okay. Uh, Jeff is running this podcast and they uh, cover some, some usually tools uh, or some engineering like subject. Uh, sometimes it's a bit like too specific for me. Uh, like when they talk about like Kafka stuff and how to like organize all those like crazy views, uh, I don't listen they, this kind of like podcast, but yeah. uh, th- they have a uh, decent stories uh, and uh, great speakers about, you know, from data world. Okay. And I really like uh, this kind of stories and uh, uh, authors. Okay. And uh, do you have any other else that you would like to add? Uh, yeah, I think those, those, those probably two, yeah, two, uh, two on top of my head. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And uh, last question is, uh, how do you see yourself in a couple of years? Do you, uh, do you think you know, DBC is going to dominate the uh, data version control, data version for everyone or anything else to add for yourself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is what you described. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, we work a lot on this, uh, our tools. Uh, we do, we have a lot of plans for DVC, a lot of different ideas, like what uh, we, sh- we need to do in, uh, inside DVC. We have a lot of ideas what we need to do, like additional to DVC, kind of for, for, the, for the ecosystem. Uh, and we have some like vision around this tool set, about, around the ecosystem. Uh, so working hard on this and I spent like pretty much uh, all my time. <laughs> <laughs> on the, and then this is like, we return back to the uh, question about vacations, right? This is why I don't have vacations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because too much time for DVC. But, <laughs> but I thank you because I'm a user of it and I can thank you for that because <laughs> you're making my life easier by losing a little bit of your free time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it, uh, it's not like uh, only my project, right? There are a lot of folks that are working on this project. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, thank yeah, you to everyone on DBC project. Community users, a uh, lot, of, lot of people are involved in this project today. But it's really, I, I think people should really consider using that kind of tool because it's really, for myself, the, the first, because what I started to use was uh, for uh, a reproductibility challenge. And we're just trying to take a look at what the tool needs to be used. And just the part where you download your data set in, uh, in, in hash. So you really download the data set like this. I think our data set was 10 gig and uh, it took like less than a minute to download it. And by using other avenues, it was like an hour just to download it. So just that I was like, okay, so this is really built on something intelligent. It's just like, it's not like brute force approach. It's really brilliant. So um, I, it's really yeah. a good tool. Yeah, and uh, this performance is because we work with storages directly, right? Mm-hmm. We don't want to be like between you and your storage or between you and our storage. We just say, you need storage, go for it. <laughs> right? And it's brilliant because it's really more straightforward. And uh, yes. it can make a, a small difference on the long run. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for your work and thank you for your participation and uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. (laughs) You're welcome.